I'm really excited for this next discussion between two of my favourite minds in the country. Um, Anarchy's asked me to introduce him as a, as a man of no fixed abode. Uh, truly a global citizen with a global outlook. Um, and a master of processing large amounts of information, synthesising them and forming a, a view as to what the narrative and the positioning is, what what that means for the world. Um, Joshua, many of you seen speak earlier in the week, co-founder of Inspiral, co-founder of Dev Academy. I welcome you both to the stage. Um, uh, this is a wonderful opportunity, thank you, and uh, wonderful to be uh, here with you, Joshua. Um, I've been uh, inspired by a number of things um, uh, th this morning already. I think uh, right at the outset, as Michelle was describing her work with uh, children and um, in the technology space, I've found tears on my cheek. Um, there's something about that sacred responsibility of young human beings and creating the space and then holding the space in which uh, they grow and find themselves and are fed. Um, and uh, I just, uh, her speech just spoke to me very powerfully. Um, so I, I was curious at the outset, my qualifications for uh, sitting here, but um, I, I'm taking my tears as one qualification. Uh, there's a connection. Um, I have another qualification which the school system never really engaged me at all. Um, I was intellectually precocious, uh, so therefore I was reading two or three years above my uh, age class. I was the lone boy in the corner. And at the same time, I had plasters on my legs and there's all sorts of other reasons I was the lone boy in the corner. So I didn't really... Um, I don't have uh, positive or warm glowing uh, um, memories of those early years. Um, as a result, probably quite predictably, I was uh, reputedly in the worst third form, fourth form and fifth form at James Hargis High School, the, the years that I was there, the, the, the most disruptive classes, um, drinking 18 gallon kegs with friends and getting legless um, in the fifth form, so quite serious uh, dysfunction as I was uh, really opted out of the uh, the whole education system, so maybe that's a qualification. Um, but I have uh, obviously have some perspectives uh, and some views. Um, as it happened, I've had just a wonderful array. The universe has been very generous in giving me uh, amazing life opportunities from which I have learnt an enormous amount, along with sharing that journey with wonderful, warm, generous human beings. And the, the power of people and mentors and friends who create opportunities for us as people to explore ourselves and find our space safely, to hold us to challenges at the right time. It's not all about being easy. Um, and so I've had a wonderful and rich education. It just didn't come uh, from an institution. Um, I've done a lot of work in the indigenous space and there's a lot of wonderful stories from that territory. Uh, I've got a theory that the biggest handbrake on that whole sector of our society is human capital. There's not enough human capital in that system uh, to manage 40, 50 more billions of dollars of assets, if that's your measure, uh, but to manage the challenges of a community that's on the wrong side of all the measures uh, and the, the challenges of building their way into the future, the biggest handbreakers is there's not enough people with the skills, the life experience, enough bruises uh, to bring their own personal wisdom to create the solutions. Just thinking about this across the course of today, I do wonder whether that's true of us all and all their activities, that the biggest handbrake is ourselves or the, uh, the limits on our own capacities in our, in our various communities. Uh, so this is a very important space in my view. The other um, thing that comes to mind to me from my experience working with Naitahu is that, I'll do this very simply, but if there's an eventually these machines, these communities, as you rebuild these nation states, they create a surplus, an economic surplus. That's the point of the model. Um, and then you want to reinvest, re reinvest that surplus back into your community. How do you do it? Education obviously features, but I've long been dismayed by the lack of thinking about how that's applied. So uh, you're all tribal members, you're all at the age at university. I don't care what you're doing, I'll write you all a cheque. That's the end of the conversation. 
um, it seems to me to miss a whole lot of things that you could be doing if you were being intentional about rebuilding uh, your own community. But more fundamentally, I get really interested as you look at the research, the place where you can make most impact on the, on the age curve for a human being, of course, is closer to age zero, and in fact, is at minus uh, nine months. And it's at that point of conception that the game's on, and there's a truckload of evidence to say that if you do good things at that point, think nutrition, uh, healthcare, um, of the mother's surroundings and so on, guess what, those children will be more fertile, um, less incidence of heart disease, choose your metric. Um, that period which is invisible normally, and we treat as invisible, uh, is the richest investment space. And, uh, and as we go up the curve from age one to age two and so on, uh, guess what, the 15 and 16 year olds, the die is not completely cast, as I am evidence, um, uh, but it is largely cast. So last um, rumination on that point, uh, I'm a, a parent of a, I've got a 16 year old son who's um, another gift from the universe. My wife and I were biologically unproductive. Her sister-in-law was very biologically productive. Uh, they came around and sat at our kitchen table one day and said, well, would you like this child? Um, and I can already feel myself stopping here. This is, uh, at the time, it was such an enormous challenge for my worldview uh, that your family members might come in and hand over a human being uh, who's on his way into your care. Um, so what do I do? Well, I'm a geek, I suppose. I went and looked for the manual about how you manage this complicated proposition. And um, it's really struck in my reading that um, the way I understand it is our view of the universe, the, the critical question, is the universe a beneficial, generous, warm, nurturing place, or is it a hostile environment? Your view on that is, let's say, these numbers won't be quite correct, but 60% determined by age six. Uh, so here's a point, isn't there? How do we want our uh, next um, cohorts of communities to, what's their outlook on the universe and towards each other? Um, so that space is particularly precious. I think the numbers go something like 90% of your worldview is formed by age 12. So I'm really interested in the early space and what that might mean. Um, the last leg, uh, so a few of us, uh, my wife's, uh, I'm a, an only child, uh, single parent, so I've got five cousins um, in total, I think. Uh, my wife's one of five, she's got about 100 first cousins, her mother was one of 18, her father's one of 10. There's an enormous um, small nation state in themselves, actually. Um, and they've got a long tradition in the education sector. So when uh, my mother-in-law, mum as we all know her, um, had their first child and ready for a preschool, well, she went and joined the preschool. And she was a teacher in that preschool. And as that child and the other children started to arrive and grow, they went to other schools and she joined those boards and participated in the room and taught. And up to the point of uh, high school years when um, uh, she and my father-in-law went and uh, uh, were the, uh, the parents in a Māori boarding school, Te Waipanema Girls College, for a number of years. And so mum is mum to whole cohorts of these young women who came through uh, the system. My point being that the family's got a whole um, uh, track record of being its own teacher, if you will, and holding itself and owning the responsibility uh, for this challenge. Uh, so my cohort, we have children, guess what? Uh, we're fussy, we want excellence, we want excellence in Te Reo Māori and Tikanga and so on, but we want excellence in the English language. We want access to good science skills and math skills and we're really reluctant to compromise. Why compromise anything here? Why have the Māori but not the English or vice versa? So these guys go and start an early childhood centre. This is a few years ago. Last year they got a Prime Minister's Award for governance of such a thing. So they've been doing an excellent job of this and... Um, what we've done with these kids are growing older, what do we do next? We've applied for a licence, we have a special character school licence uh, for a, a Te Pao or Rākai Hotu, it's an indigenous frame. It's exactly the point that was made earlier today, the idea of it takes a village to raise a child. Um, so we want the cultural elements. We're really interested, uh, we're feeding the children as well. Uh, those that can't afford it, we've got our ways of making sure that um, uh, that's addressed. Uh, it's, a, it's a community of celebration. So the, we've been going five weeks, so you know, I've got a long uh, track record of experience here. But um, 
uh, you get to Friday and it's time to celebrate, hey, it was Josh's birthday today. Josh, would you come up to the stage, little two-year-old or four-year-old, or uh, they're probably five, six, seven, in fact, at the moment, the cohort we've got, but there's this celebration of these people as uh, young human beings and the things that are happening for them. Uh, and Yosef's been noticed to be cleaning his teeth, particularly regularly at the moment, and we're going to celebrate good dental health, and we'll make a point of it. And uh, in, in between, uh, we've got some kapahaka going on, and... Uh, uh, so looking to create a nurturing environment uh, which is unapologetic about its roots and where it comes from, is unapologetic about its aspirations for excellence. It's very clear that the environment's a core part of this, so we want our own orchards and our gardens so we can feed our guests and ourselves. Uh, we want the technology, we want these guys to have the earliest, we want these guys to be coding. Um, and the idea of in two languages really appeals to me. Uh, as well. So, as I say, four weeks in, very early, three age cohorts only, but going to 700 students in, in due course, it's an experiment. Another theme that comes up uh, today, and it, it's very big in my life, actually, is I think we need to run experiments. We need, and I think, Joshua, you might have mentioned this a couple of days ago, be mindful, intelligent, intentional, try something. Be careful with it and learn fast and iterate. So think Lean Canvas. Yeah, this whole methodology, the language, the mindset is exactly right to, to grapple with these questions, uh, in my view. Um, but they, they need to be uh, applied with discipline. The um, early days, we're taking our success measure from the fact that um, the kids cry when you ask them to go home at the end of the day, not when they have to come to school in the morning. So they're enjoying it. Uh, it's very vibrant um, uh, so far. I think the last thing, uh, and um, uh, I'll stop, the, um, with Evan and I were comparing grand universe uh, theories about the universe last night, um, which I was very much enjoying, uh, I think that we're on a journey of reclamation, really. I, I don't know that we're building anything new. Um, these tribal groups, uh, all of us are tribal from tribal groups, we were self-contained, we were whole. Uh, we worked as a single um, meshed, coordinated block that was self-nurturing. We were our own parents in our own universities, in our own space, in our own houses. Uh, and what we've done is we've got more and more specialised, of course with enormous effect. We're, Adam Smith uh, methodologies and so on, we're enormously productive now, but we've become, uh, we've separated this from that and we've thought about them differently. I think, I believe that what we're doing is stitching some of these things back together, making them whole again, healing them, and somewhere in there is a, is a very powerful place, and I hope that we can provide an environment where we can help more of our, uh, the generations that follow find and build that place in their own image. I think that's the challenge. Kia ora mai. Cool, that was um, delightful. Uh, I've known anarchy for a fair while, and but that's the first time I've heard that story in its fullness. So it was in, very much enjoyed. Uh, and I think where I come from is probably at the complete other end of the spectrum of education. So hopefully between the two, we'll see some interesting threads emerge. Uh, I'm fairly new to the education sector. Uh, long time entrepreneur, long time programmer. Uh, a couple of years ago, I was running a technical recruitment business and there was just nowhere near enough people we saw acutely the pain that uh, the organisations and employers felt by not having enough talent. And my business partner said, we should go and get into an education, we, we need to start training people. So I knew the founder of Dev Bootcamp in San Francisco, which is an intensive nine week uh, intensive training course to take people from no programming experience to enough skills to get a job as a junior developer. Very much grew up in the sort of the, the talent um, context of Silicon Valley, but then it spread to New York, Chicago, and there's probably about 50 of these boot camps around the US and growing around the world. So we saw, we thought maybe that model would work in Wellington. So this was a year and a half ago, and we basically we licensed the model and the business, and we brought it over here and started training programmers. So I found myself in the situation of uh, getting right up close with tertiary education, and on some aspects of it, it was absolutely delightful and the, like the, there is something sacred about education and there is something special about that, watching people grow and investing in people and human development. And I think that where education finishes and where human development starts, is, it's really blurry and, and you can hear all this talk about nutrition and well-being and, and a context bleeding into uh, classrooms and concepts and lectures and whatnot. 
And so getting to see that and having that experience of trying to be a good teacher, of connecting what is, what is it I love about programming and how can I help people connect to what they love about programming as the very first thing, and then weaving that into the context of curriculum and, and boot camps and whatnot. So that, that's been my world for the last uh, year. And a delightful world it is, but it's also, I started to bump up to the tertiary education sector in New Zealand for the first time. And I was absolutely horrified with what I saw. Uh, it was the the context, the, and like my understanding is that uh, there's been a lot of systemic change over the last 10 years, like 15, 20 years ago, it was the wild west of accredited providers getting away with close to fraud of like, we say we're educating someone, but we're not delivering on it. And that a lot of the systemic responses are about ensuring that if you get money to educate someone, you actually educate them and that qualifications and certifications and whatnot. The consequence of that has been what I would describe as a system that feels quite mad to me. And again, I don't want to be uh, too uh, uh, critical of the system, but uh, my perspective coming into it has been, it's, it feels quite mad. That uh, you see tertiary education providers where if you do not get the, same, the number of students that you've been funded to get, your funding will be permanently cut and you can't get it back. The consequence of that alone on an operator is that if we don't get the numbers, we're permanently get a haircut in our funding. And if you want to revise your course, that is a month, multiple month long process to change one aspect of how you're educating people. And the consequence of that on adapting to sort of systems and processes and, and whatnot. And so the other part of it is that it feels like uh, for tertiary and getting degrees and, and qualifications, there was this social contract that that's what you did to be successful. Like, to, if, you were, if you cared about your, your children or their development, then you would want them to go to university and get a degree. And that if you did that, it was very likely you would get a good job. And that that social contract feels like it has broken down substantially, where the, the relationship between tertiary qualifications and employment is broken. And it's broken in the US, it's broken here, it's broken in the UK, that the degrees do not mean employability anymore. But still, a lot of people feel like they do. And a lot of people go into tertiary education with the explicit intent of employability. And uh, they don't even measure how many of them get jobs, let alone tell everyone about it. Like, the, the, what we did, which was radical and bold, was against each cohort that we went through, we published their employment numbers next to the thing on the sort of application page. And that was considered dramatically radical and courageous, being honest about the employment outcomes of our students. And I think that starts to highlight how deeply the system is corrupted and co-opted by educators who are educating but not delivering. And so I think that it feels like there's a lot of work to do as a system. And I guess that's, that's sort of been my main learning from the, the last year, is that uh, I, you meet with students <clears throat> um, and they come to you with their hopes and dreams in their hands. Like um, one guy, he was a Vietnamese student, um, foreign student, you know, the export market we keep trying to win and get great revenue money in for. His family, the sacrifices they had made to send him to New Zealand to do a, a bachelor's of information systems. And he comes out the end not even close to employable. And his institution did not care. Did, he, he was done, they were finished, he got his qualification, a meaningless qualification. And I think that seeing that up close, compared to what's possible, in terms of, uh, uh, for us, like it's, it does not take three years to train a programmer to get them employable. Give me six months with someone who's um, interested in programming and they can get a job at the end of that six months. You know, it's, it takes, it's, six months will do it. And the universities haven't even gone close to exploring that possibility because they're in a context of three-year degrees. And that the, the arrogance which comes with, from academia, like the first thing we did as recruiters was, let's go up and talk to the university about how we can help your students be more employable because our businesses have to spend six months training when they hire them. And they just show us the door straight away didn't want to have a conversation about how to interact with industry. So I guess that, that experience has shaped a lot of my world. And the, the, so what we do is essentially, uh, it's a completely private provider. Uh, it costs about $11,000, which is quite a lot for a short course. 
Um, if someone doesn't have the money, we lend it to them so we can afford to fund 20% of the, the fees of, of the course ourselves. We've never turned someone away because they can't afford it. We actively work on um, uh, diversity and Māori and women in particular. We want to see population parity first in our course and secondly in our industry. And we're just jumping out there and doing it and it's been a hard ride, but that's sort of our journey. And the, for me, it's, it's the, the scary part of it is it hasn't been that hard. Like it was hard, but not that hard. And we put maybe, you know, borrowed maybe $100,000 to do it. We licensed the model from something which is successfully improving in San Francisco. And we're just trying to make a dent in IT training and education. The fact that that's an anomaly and that accurately reporting employment outcomes of our courses is radical makes, I think for me, that's an indicator of how um, much work our education system needs to go. So that's, I guess, the main sort of perspective and perception where I'm coming from. And yeah, really keen to see where the conversation goes from there. Joshua, I'm curious. Um, um, I've got um, proximity advantage here, so I'll just ask you a question. Um, so you've got a slice, you've got a, a subject area, and you've got a model that's delivering that. Uh, do you think that it would be reasonable to teach English this way? Or um, are you just thinking about how, what's its scalability across the verticals? I, I think it depends completely on the sector and the type of skills. The main, uh, one of the main principles, I think, is around having people learn from practicing professionals and learn in the context of people working in that field. So this is an area where I'd say that medicine traditionally does it very well. Like if you think about the journey that medical professionals go through to become qualified, a huge amount of that is in a hospital, multiple years. And that there's, a, there's this deep practical element to that training. When you think about how programmers are trained, it's very different. You're locked away in academia, and then you might have a little bit of industry interaction. Most of the people teaching you may have once been in industry, but are now in research. That you now have a, a very strong bias for the people who are teaching you to draw you into the research world and not the sort of working world. So I think there's two different sectors, and I think it's a case-by-case -case basis. Like, it might not be you can do a six-month uh, or a nine-week boot camp and a, in a six-month context would work for other sectors. It might mean you'd have to do it a bit differently. It might be one year or two years and so on. So I think it depends. Um, so you go around the other way. <clears throat> you think about it from the system point of view. Um, I guess one of the benefits, unquote, of a system which is relatively um, uh, evenly spread is that a BA from this university might be broadly equivalent to a BA from Otago and, and so on. So you get sort of these logic blocks that you can say, oh, that's at 50 metres, that's a BA, I know roughly what that is. Um, so so there's, a, there's a number of registered tokens in the market, I guess, and I just wonder if we had a whole lot of Dev Academy or initiatives that are individual does the does the is the market then got a, an information problem? Is Dev Academy a good brand or a bad one? Or I'm just curious about um, how the market gets the noise out of it. Yeah, as as like IT professionals, we are good at solving information problems. So the reason that you have a a Bachelor of Arts and that means something, or a Bachelor of Science and that means something, is because that was an information signal when you had physical pieces of paper and you'd send them overseas on a boat, sort of thing that in the context of rich information systems, I can really accurately see your profile, your portfolio. I can call up most of the people you've worked with and ask them what they think of your skills. That in a deeply interconnected world, I think that the, the, the information signaling of a qualification is marginal. There might still be some place for it, but I think that moving away from accreditation to reputation is a fundamental transition in how we do education. And I think it, it affects a huge amount of stuff about how we assess people. Um, and that idea of portfolio-based education pieces where you can see the work someone has done, you can talk to the people they have worked with, that's all the information you need to make an assessment on them. And that, you know, whether they've done a degree or not just becomes a very early filter, uh, I'd say, of marginal value. So I'm curious about the, the, I guess, the intersection between this very close to the, the metal where you can measure, measure education on how well you're doing based off employment outcomes as opposed to quite early stages that what, what's common between those two places? 
what's what's the difference? Like, is it even part of the same system? And does it make sense to think of them in relation to each other? Mm, great question. Um, I, I think we've got challenges. Really, already we've got some parents who I was having a chat with a couple of them the other day uh, came to pick up. Um, uh, the children, and they're saying, oh, look, we're, we're just loving this, and the kids are really happy, and they're coming home, and they're chatting, and they're telling us about the Tanifa story, and they're doing the thing, and um, never seen this much energy and excitement. Um, but they don't seem to have much homework. Mm. So, in fact, our, our own thoughts about what good schooling is is that, you know, you should be at your desk for two hours every night and scribbling in your book because you've got some homework to do. And so there's this, and some of the parents have got the challenge, quite understandably, that's, that's all they know is a system, but they're not seeing these different systems as a... Uh, um, is doing the heavy lifting that's needed. So already our own community is raising these questions about it. Is this, so how you measure uh, whether you're on the right track or not. Um, I think laughter's not a bad place to start, but um, it's, a, it's a serious question. Mm. We're, we're going to try from early childhood all the way to year 13, so we've got to think hard about this stuff because they get only our channel is their exposure, really. Is there much sort of... Uh peer education going on or exploring the ideas of the relationship between them? Between the pupils? Oh, yeah, between pupils and different ages. So um, really keen to play with the Tuakana uh, Taina idea that um, the, the older siblings have got some responsibilities to the younger ones because they're, they're more mature and so on, but um, equally that the, the younger members of the family have always got things to teach the older members. Uh, they're the precocious ones, they'll get up to a bit more mischief, they're, um, or the idea of everyone's a teacher and everyone's a learning. So, really keen to um, uh, support that idea of traditional hierarchy but not in a, a one-way direction model. One thing I really enjoy is um, uh, the aforementioned son, what we've done is put him in private boarding school in Christchurch, in a sort of elite, elite school, so I've done exactly the opposite. Um, uh, and what they do is they've got really interesting leadership development. It's interesting to study, actually. They do a good job of saying, hey, you're, you're, you're older than me, so therefore you've got some leadership responsibilities, which is actually a tua kind of tainer, mm -hmm. uh type um, uh, relationship. So I think there's something in, very powerful in that, and, and the peer group. I took far more notice of my peers than I did ever did of parents or uh, aunts and uncles. So I think role modelling we're very, uh, very serious about. Mm. I think that concept of tua kind of tainer, that was, uh, I bumped into that maybe five, six years ago in New Zealand, the idea of uh, elder sibling, younger sibling, and that it's a, it's a dynamic thing, so that you might be better at me that, at programming and I might be better at you at uh, reading, and that in, in those different contexts, the relationship would switch, and that it really inspired a lot of my thinking around uh, designing education environments where it's not all on the teacher, a teacher becomes much more of a facilitator and a, this is what a learning journey is and the teacher's on their own learning journey and that's and sort of modelling what it means to actively learn and to actively ask for help. And so that, uh, is that like a fair, accurate representation of the concept or am I just making stuff up uh, based on the inspiration? Oh, you're making it up very well, yep. <laughs> Sharing it around, go, go to where, it's actually just rational. Where's the resource? Are oh, you the resource on the subject? Let's go to you. Mm -hmm. uh, Rebecca's the resource on that subject. Let's go to her. Uh, um, one of my pastimes, I did a degree at Harvard, actually, when I finally got to university, and um, the, the lovely speech at the commencement uh, speech where the, uh, the big flash uh, person gets up and says, oh, well, you're all on to us now. The recipe actually is that we get you here, we put a lot of effort into selection, and then we get the hell out of the road, and um, actually you guys just taught yourself across this year. And it, it's very true. That experience was enormously rich, and it was rich because you and I were in the classroom and we um, uh, worked together and we... Well, we grew together, really, so some, something powerful there. Cool. I guess a uh, final comment before we jump into questions. Uh, the current, uh, I guess, uh, edge of my learning in this year of sort of uh, just diving into education is around the concept of uh, collaboration between teachers and collaboration between teaching organisations. Who's familiar with open source software? A bunch of people? So it's... Generally, it's the concept that programmers will write some code and instead of just keeping it locked away, they'll put it up online, anyone can use it and they'll share it. So it's about uh, publishing the, the key IP in software. And the open source movement over the last de two decades or so has transformed how we build software. Things that used to take me, you know, I'd charge $50,000 for 10 years ago, 
you can do them for five or less now. Like a, a dramatic increase in productivity because of deep sharing and collaboration of resources. I think there's an immediate opportunity to apply the same sort of thinking to education. So that if you're a teacher or an education provider and you're using curriculum, that by having curriculum put into the commons, and not just put out there, because that's, that's pretty easy, but then it's expensive to use, but put in there with a, an interface which is, it slots into generic learning management systems, you can start to dramatically get the same exponential increase in the cost of improving curriculum so that it becomes much cheaper to improve and you can continuously improve it. And that way, as someone who's putting together a, a talk or a lecture on something, I can just go and, uh, like I would pull in software into my project, pull in curriculum into my class. And that's, that's, the, that's the project I'm most focused on this year, is building up that sort of thing, modeling it very closely off open source software, very likely using GitHub as a delivery mechanism, but make it so that you can just build up your package file, these, these, these things, put in your custom linkings between it, and have quite high quality curriculum as a result. So just wanted to drop that idea as well. Thanks, Joshua. Thanks, Anarchy. So we've got about five minutes for questions and reflections. So who's first? Anarchy, I have a question for you. Um, so you spoke uh, a bit at the beginning about the, um, the opportunities with the indigenous community and skills training and um, the, the current handbrakes, as you said. Uh, I'm curious for those you know, community members who may not be interested in uh, the technical fields so much, um, what else we can do to bridge the opportunities around uh, environmental restoration and land stewardship and some of the new practices that might be emerging? Say, for instance, you know, not really a new practice, but permaculture. And what does permaculture training look like? Um, and I'm just curious, based on your understanding of the dynamics, if there's any thoughts or reflections you have on, on those types of notions. Um, thank you. Look, I, I think there's a lot of... Um, territory to explore here that could be explored with uh, great value. I think a, a lot of, it's hard to generalise across the country, the, the realities are different um, but there are communities with need there are communities that don't have their own food systems, there are people, communities with high unemployment, um, you can start to put some things together that would make sense and help build healthy communities, more resilient communities, employed communities uh, and so on. So I, I think there's some really important ideas here which I think are opportunities um, for the country actually uh, to, to think about. Um, I think it's a game for the patient would be a phrase that I find myself using in this space. And it's very easy to underestimate the, uh, the trauma that these communities have been through in the past to start with, if we're going to stay with the indigenous uh, sector. Um, the actual, it's actually trauma involved in getting out of that spot and reframing your own narrative and building your own institutions. How do you elect yourself? How would you run your own parliament? How would you, it goes on and on. There's a whole lot of aspects of community building which really take all the oxygen out of the room. And unfortunately, these, these new frontiers have been just a step too far, a luxury for later. And what I'm hoping is that we're starting to see increasingly green shoots as some of these communities have been capitalized for 10 or 20 years now. And um, it's, on your point, absolutely. I think any idea that there's a, just a track that we all go to Stanford or Harvard or pick your name brand um, and that leads you somewhere, I think those days have long gone. That was last century. So um, we've really got to address a reality. Um, and without, without apology either, I think, no shame in, um, in fact, a lot of money in being a serviceman and a plumber in Christchurch in particular if you're down there at the moment. So uh, we are seeing the emergence of... Uh, the revalidation of the trade sectors and so on uh, as well. So it's not all, we're not completely fixated about the academic track anymore as we, we used to be. Cool. Time for a couple more questions <coughs> or reflections. Just a reflection from me, um, Anaki. I really like what you had to say about um, it's all in the curation of the students and then the, the teacher can step back and... Um, a couple of people have asked me this week if I'm stressed or nervous and I've just thought, not at all, look who's here, look at, look at what's happening here, which is just, you know, the seeds of discussion going into shoots, which has nothing to do with any one masterful person standing up here and dictating what this class is learning. We're teaching each other, which is really beautiful to see. Um, further, one further, here we go, down the back here, Xander. 
Hey, this is a reflection on what Josh was saying uh, about the dev bootcamp model. Um, I found it really interesting. We took on an engineer uh, about a year ago who went through General Assembly, um, and his, which is a similar thing to dev bootcamp. Uh, so he had he had done a degree in philosophy, um, and he had no uh, computer science engineering background. And he's been able to jump in and be really, really effective. And in 12 months, he's come like an incredibly long way. And he would be more useful to us than a grad from any university that is graduating kids who are doing studying computer science. Um, so I, f I find that really compelling for the dev bootcamp model. And I think that it's the way to go if you want to um, enter into the industry and, and be employable. The from my own experience, so I did a Bachelor of Arts, but I majored in computer science. Um, I came out, like if I just did my coursework, I would be pretty much useless in the um, like software engineering realm. But essentially all, all, all of what I do in my day job has been things I've learned on the side. Um, but I'm not, it's this strange like um, dilemma I have in my mind where it's like, I look back at that experience of my undergraduate degree and I'm like, well, I didn't really learn a whole lot of stuff that I'm applying and using today and that's really frustrating and I could have learned a lot more and I would have come out and right now my skills would be a lot further than it, than it is. Um, but at the same time, I do see a huge amount of value in having been forced to study the arts because if I hadn't have done that, I would have just gone straight into um, engineering. And I think that we do want our engineers to have um, a flavor of what the arts offer in terms of like how it helps you think and how it helps you be a human. Um, so I really love the dev bootcamp model and I think that it's the way to go to get engineers into the, into the, like, the workforce. But I think there's also, there is importance in also having people who are going through that to, to have the other parts of them develop as well. You know, not, I don't think you want to just take kids. I, 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 I guess what I'm saying is I see value in the college and university academia kind of model. I just don't think that it's being executed correctly. And the dev food camp is definitely the way to go for industry, but there also needs to be a way to get the arts into these engineers at the same time. <laughs> I absolutely agree. And I think that the, the main learning for me from that line of thinking is that we have we have uh, put tertiary education as your whole, pretty much most of your adult education. You might go back and do a postgrad sort of thing, and you might have a personal learning practice, but it's usually a solitary personal learning practice, and it's usually snuck in the edges of not much time. And I think that in the context of like education sort of evolution, things like chalkal or lifelong education, which is around how you start to have deep education for your adult life, which is not just isolated and solitary and in the margins, but it's part of, you know, being an adult is constantly learning on things. Because if you think about, like we, we always say to our programmers, it'll take you three years to be good. And you're still going to have to spend a big chunk of time learning, but you only have to, you know, wear that yourself for the first six months. The other two and a half months you're paid to keep learning. And I think that if you think about trying to design a well-rounded education for someone, which has you know, the, the technical parts of their career, but also has, uh, uh, includes that wider appreciation, that more fundamental education of humanities and arts and philosophy and lots of other things, you could start to design a whole lot of stuff in that other two and a half years. You just, and you, can, you could do that much more cost-effectively and much more uh, tailor-made for each individual person to get, and it wouldn't end at that three year time. Like if you build that community and that practice, that will keep going for the next two decades. And I think we'll start to see much more capable people who came through that sort of process than a three year stint and then workforce and self-directed at the end of it. I'd like to thank Joshua and Anarchy for sharing your thoughts with us. Thank you very much.